Luke Acts for beginners. This is lesson number 21, Paul's second missionary journey, Acts chapter 15, verse 36 to uh, chapter 18, verse 22. So we, uh, we left off uh, at the scene where the apostles and elders in Jerusalem had diffused an extremely divisive uh, situation by sending a letter to the church in Antioch. And if we recall correctly, the church at Antioch was made up of both Jews and, Gentile, uh, Jews and Gentiles who were converted to Christianity. And so the, um, the, uh, the church in Jerusalem uh, sent them a letter instructing them that contrary to certain teachings they had received, they did not need to be circumcised before they could become Christians. This particular idea had been promoted by Jewish Pharisees who had converted to Christianity, but wanted to impose their former Jewish legalism on these converts or on Gentile converts to Christianity. Their idea was that in order to become a Christian, which was an offshoot of Judaism in their mind, you needed to keep the Jewish law and the most obvious sign of this was the Jewish rite of circumcision. This false idea was repudiated by the leaders in Jerusalem and they informed the brethren of their decision and advice by letter delivered by Paul and Barnabas and Silas and Barsabbas. Their decision also confirmed and approved the work that Paul and Barnabas had done among the Gentiles and gave it legitimacy among the brotherhood. Otherwise, there would not have been a second or third missionary efforts. Could you imagine if this, had, you know, if this teaching had, had been confirmed by the leaders, in, uh, the leaders in Jerusalem would have ruined the work among the Gentiles. After delivering the letter uh, to the church, Luke writes that Paul, Barnabas, and now Silas remained in Antioch teaching the church there, probably reinforcing the uh, ideas that were sent in the letter and undoing some of the doctrinal confusion caused by the uh, teachers of the circumcision. This problem would continue to plague the early church because Paul speaks of it again in Galatians 5 verse 12 and in the letter to the Colossians chapter 2 verses 11 to 17. So now we begin uh, Paul's second missionary journey in Acts uh, chapter 15, somewhere around 49 to 50, uh, 52 AD, and uh, begins with dispute actually, a dispute. After a time in Antioch, Paul proposes that he and Barnabas return to the field in order to strengthen the churches that they had planted on their previous uh, journey. Barnabas and Paul have a disagreement at this point over bringing uh, Barnabas' cousin John Mark with them. The issue is settled as Paul chooses Silas to work with him and Barnabas takes John Mark under his wing and returns to the work in Cyprus, um, his original home. Remember the first missionary journey, that's the first place they went. He and, um, and you know, Paul and Barnabas and John Mark, they went to Cyprus first. It was a kind of friendly territory, if you wish. So uh, Barnabas takes John Mark and goes back to Cyprus to continue the work. Now this is only speculation, but it seems that Paul had outgrown the mentor relationship that he had with Barnabas and Silas was a more suitable partner for him uh, at this point in his ministry. John Mark, on the other hand, still affected by his failure to keep up on the first missionary journey, but willing to try again, was in need of a good teacher and a mentor. And he had one in, in Barnabas. Through God's providential care, this incident that threatened to break up one team of missionaries actually produced two teams. And we know that John Mark went on to serve both Paul and then Peter in later years and ended up writing one of the gospels, the gospel of Mark, that was John Mark who did, who did that. So we move ahead to chapter 15, and he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek, and he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. 
Now while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number uh, daily. So we see that the objectives at the beginning of this second journey are twofold. One, to read and explain the letter sent by the apostles you know, con concerning the circumcision business. And secondly, to strengthen the faith of these young Christians in the churches that Paul and Barnabas had originally planted. They also add Timothy to their number, who was probably given the tasks uh, originally done by uh, John Mark. Note that despite championing the right of Gentiles becoming Christians without the obligation to be circumcised, Paul goes ahead and circumcises Timothy, whose father was a Greek and a, and a, and a non-believer. This was necessary not for Timothy to become a Christian, he was already a Christian, but it was required to enter synagogues where Paul preached since uncircumcised men were not allowed entry into a synagogue and it was known that Timothy's father was a Gentile. So to avoid any problems, he circumcised Timothy. Another episode now in chapter 16, beginning in verse six, let's read that. It says, they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mysia, they were trying to go into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So from their starting point, in um, Antioch, in Syria, to Troas is approximately 785 miles. You know, it's only, there's like a line there in, in, you know, in the book of Acts. They, they were here and they went there. We don't realize the distance covered. Luke describes the trip in a few verses, but their overland route could have taken them several months. The Roman road system at the time permitted fairly safe travel, and people like Paul walked some 15 to 20 miles a day uh, they would stay in inns or homes of friends or synagogues. Aside from their work in the churches, they established the first trip. Much of their journey was a failed attempt to go eastward. They were trying to go east to Asia. The spirit preventing them that Luke mentions could mean a variety of setbacks or obstacles that prevented them from successfully preaching the gospel in that region. You know, it could be a washed out bridge or no available synagogues. Uh, illness, uh, uh, lack of finances, uh, perhaps a, a message in a dream or a vision. Uh, in some way, the Holy Spirit was preventing them from you know, doing their work uh, towards the east. Once they had headed east and arrived at the coastal city of Troas, Paul has a vision that finally provides the direction that they are seeking. The dream in, uh, is general in nature, you know, come to Macedonia, no more details of who or where or how, but Paul's faith is strong enough to act based on this limited instruction. And so he arrives at Philippi. So in his vision, Paul saw a man of Macedonia calling out to him for help. So Paul and his companions, they set out from Troas and they head for this city of Philippi, which was a leading city in the Macedonian region. Once there, they, they seek out a place where Jews might gather so that uh, Paul might find an opportunity to preach. So let's, um, let's take a look at Acts chapter 16. It says, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by God. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So with these baptisms, the church is established in Philippi. In Acts 16, 16 to 24, we're not going to read that, but in the following verses, Luke describes an incident that resembled what took place in Cyprus during the first missionary journey. There, 
Paul struck blind a sorcerer who was trying to hinder his work. In Philippi, he casts out an evil spirit from a girl who had been following them about and drawing attention to their ministry. Paul, not wanting a witness from a girl possessed of an evil spirit, uh, quiets her by casting out the spirit. Of course, this led to a riot stirred up by the girl's handlers who made a living using her uh, uh, adult skills, uh, not adult, but occult skills. Paul and Silas are then dragged before the judge, they're beaten and then put into prison with their feet uh, locked in, in, in stocks. The only difference here was that their imprisonment was not caused by the Jews this time. And so we get to uh, Acts chapter 16, we'll read this section beginning in verse 25. It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for the lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole uh, household. Now I want you to notice that the jailer had some knowledge of the faith because the earthquake and the fact that none of the prisoners escaped moves him to ask the same question that the crowd on Pentecost Sunday asked Peter. In other words, brethren, what shall we do? Well, you know, how are we going to be saved? Luke records only a summary of what Paul taught him which in a few words was that faith in Christ would save him. But notice that the very first thing the jailer does after confessing his faith is to submit to baptism, just like the crowd at Pentecost. Now, Luke doesn't mention Paul teaching the jailer and his household about baptism, but the fact that this is the first thing he does after acknowledging his belief tells us that he was taught about this as part of the gospel message. Now, an interesting postscript here that we read about uh, you know, uh, all the way to verse 40, an interesting postscript is that when the magistrates sought to release them quietly, Paul reminds them of his Roman citizenship and the illegal manner in which they were treated. And he refuses to go unless publicly released by the judges themselves. And of course, he didn't want someone to accuse him of escaping from jail in some future attack. You know, on him, accusing him of being an escaped convict. He wanted to make sure that it was very public that he was being released properly by the magistrates. And so the judges release him publicly and legally. He leaves the jail, he pays a farewell visit to Lydia and is uh, moved and moves on to another location to preach the gospel. This other location would be Thessalonica and we'll read about that beginning in chapter 17. There's the uh, location uh, you know, of Thessalonica in relationship to Philippi. So we read in chapter 17, now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have upset the world have come here also, and Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there's another king, Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things, and when they had received the pledge from Jason and the others, 
they release them. So do you notice a pattern here? You know, first Paul arrives at a city and he finds a place where he can preach. And as takes place in every place that he preaches, some people believe and others don't. The believers follow Paul and desire more teaching. And then some of the disbelievers cause trouble for Paul. Paul then leaves or escapes and the cycle repeats itself in another location. So despite the trouble, however, a church is planted in the city of Thessalonica. He moves on to the city of Berea in Acts chapter 17, verses 10 to 14. Berea is the exception to this cycle that proves the rule. Here the Jews are eager to hear Paul and to consider everything according to the scriptures. Many of them are converted along with Greek proselytes to Judaism. Unfortunately, this fruitful work is upset as a familiar cycle is repeated. This time, however, it is not the Bereans who cause the trouble, but Jews from Thessalonica who come over to disrupt Paul's ministry among the Bereans. They spirit him safely out of town, leaving Timothy and Silas to continue the work among the Bereans for a time. After his time in Berea, Paul makes his way to the great city of Athens. Let's read a little bit about what takes place there in Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 15. Now, those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they left. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming? for you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. Now what is interesting about Paul's time in Athens is that no church was planted upon his arrival and his early preaching in the synagogue. Luke only records that Paul reasoned with the Jews and the Gentile converts, but there's no mention of anyone believing or being baptized. And there is no mention of any responses as a result of his preaching in the public square early in his ministry there. Instead, Luke records the invitation and the speech that Paul delivers at Mars Hill. Uh, this was a significant, um, this was a significant uh, event because it was his first and most direct contact with the elite philosophers and thinkers of that day. The speech would be the most important showcase of Christian ideas and gospel message to the pagan mindset gathered in one place. So first, let's get a little background about you know, Mars Hill. Mars Hill is a Roman name for a hill located in Athens. Uh, in Greek, it was called Hill of Ares, the god of war known to the Romans as Mars, and thus the name Mars Hill. The, this is the modern view of it, as you can see. Now the Areopagus was the Supreme Council or the Upper Council, a body of elected officials. They were elected for life, very much like a judge on the Supreme Court here in the United States. And these judges met in this location. These men were the great and famous of Athens who gathered to hear cases dealing exclusively with homicide, but also to hear the newest ideas in philosophy, religion, and other areas of human thinking and knowledge. And so on that day, they were gathered to hear this new religion, this new teaching as befitting the rich and powerful who are in every generation, usually the first ones to come into contact with new and visionary ideas. So this is Paul's first speech to a large, influential, and completely pagan audience. He will not argue his case from the prophets or the scriptures as he has done with the Jewish audiences. Very interesting how he approaches. So let's 
Go back to the text, verse 22, it says, so Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and all things in it, since He is Lord of heavens and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is He served by human hands as though He needed anything. Since He Himself gives to all people life and breath and all things, and He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. For in Him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are also His children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art or the thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent, because He has fixed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom He has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising Him from the dead. Now I want you to note that Paul bases his speech on their notion of God, not a Jewish notion of God, their notion of God, which was pantheistic, in other words, they had many gods. Paul's first objective is to move them from the concept of many gods to the concept of only one God. Next, he explains that this one God is the source of everything that exists and is not dependent on man, nor is his nature human or material. His following point is that God requires certain things from his creation, including man, and at some point will judge the world something that his audience of judges could relate to. And then finally, he introduces Christ and his resurrection, but he's not able to finish because they cut him off at this point. So let's just keep reading. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. So Paul went out of their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris and others uh, and others with him. So up to this point uh, you know, of his speech, up to the point of resurrection, uh, Paul's speech was, uh, was well received, since the points he was making demonstrated a logical and superior way to think about divine beings. For example, one God versus many gods. Uh, an all-powerful God versus their idea of demigods of Greek mythology. A God who creates man versus their idea of man creating God and a God who dispenses justice rather than human beings dispensing justice. So, so Paul's you know, image and teaching about the true God is immediately superior to what they had understood to this point. However, they balked at the idea of the resurrection of Jesus because although they believed in an afterlife for the soul, they considered the flesh evil and a hindrance to the journey of the soul which was released from the material body at death. The idea of a human body resurrecting from the dead, something you know, accepted by faith, seemed ridiculous and useless to them since their afterlife belief uh, centered on the soul getting out of the body in which it was trapped. They believed the soul was trapped in the body and the flesh was evil, and finally the soul was released. So to, to, to have the body resurrected, you know, for them was you know, just one step too far. They dismissed Paul, but not before two prominent people and other individuals believed and followed Paul for more teaching, showing that God's word and his message never return empty. And so, uh, we move on, or Paul moves on, to the next uh, city, which is Corinth, and we'll read in chapter 18, we begin there. It says, after these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, and he came to them. 
And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. So Luke includes a fascinating glimpse into the everyday life of Paul, how he got around, how he financed some of his travel, and the conditions in which he lived. Aquila and Priscilla, his wife, are uh, Priscilla, the wife of Aquila, um, are introduced here, and uh, we will see them again a little bit later on in the narrative. Note also Luke's attention to historical detail. You know, he mentions not only the city that the three of them are in, the city of Corinth, but also a time marker as well. We know that Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome. We know this historically, and we know that Claudius reigned from 41 to 54 AD. So we keep reading in Acts chapter 18, but when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius, uh, Justus, a worshiper of God whose house was next to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all, his, uh, all of his household and many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And he settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So Paul stays in Corinth for an 18 month period after the Lord encouraged him to remain there and continue teaching and preaching. Uh, several prominent Jews are converted as well as Gentiles, but when the Jews resisted and blasphemed, Paul shifted his efforts to the Gentiles and he's encouraged to continue doing so after the encouragement of the Lord. He's also preaching full time now that Silas and Timothy have come to help him. So now they're working, they're providing resources so he can give himself over to his uh, preaching ministry full time. Well, after a long period of uninterrupted ministry, the old cycle of opposition from the Jews will again begin and Paul is arrested. The judge will release Paul seeing that uh, this is a civil case uh, uh, rather, this is not a civil case, but a religious dispute. And so we'll jump forward to Acts 18, uh, Acts 18, 18. It says, Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and put out to sea for Syria. And with him were Priscilla and Aquila. In Chancrea he had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. They came to Ephesus and he left them there. Now he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer time, he did not consent, but taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again if God wills, he set sail from Ephesus. When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and went down to Antioch. So Luke writes that Paul continued ministering after the trial, but after a year and a half, he felt that it was time to return home. He brings Aquila and Priscilla with him and he leaves them in Ephesus where he spends very little time, but he promises to return. And we'll find out later that Ephesus becomes a very important center uh, for uh, evangelism to that, uh, to that area. Paul finishes his second missionary journey by greeting the church at Caesarea, uh, which was the port of entry uh, located there, and uh, then made his way north uh, to his home congregation to report on his trip. And of course, he's been away a couple of years uh, to get some uh, uh, well, needed, uh, well needed rest. All right, well, we're going to stop here uh, in our textual study and maybe uh, draw a couple of lessons that we, um, uh, that we can uh, see uh, through this uh, narrative here. I think some pretty practical things. Not, not, not just kind of theological lessons, but just practical lessons for everyday Christian living. For example, it's possible to have a dispute in the church without having a division. 
You know, the dis we go back at the beginning of the section we, we studied today. The disagreement between Paul and Barnabas is rather typical in the church, isn't it? Two brothers really invested in the work disagree on how to proceed. Here's a situation where Satan could drive a wedge between these two men that could start a, a, a complete division in the church. Note, however, that there was no division and no one quit the church. I believe that they brought their problem to the church leadership for a resolution. You know, in Acts chapter 15, verse 40, it says, but Paul chose Silas and left, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. You know, Luke mentions this to underscore that the church was aware of and blessed the resolution that they had come to um, as far as continuing with the work. That you know, Barnabas will go one way, Paul will go the other. The church blesses Paul's continued ministry with, uh, with uh, Silas. My point here is that we should bring church matters to the elders when there are disputes or offenses. This is both a good way to seek resolution and it guards against division and the breaking of fellowship over, over petty things. Uh, lesson number two, you don't know the last step before you take the first step. You know, Paul was looking for direction after the door of opportunity closed for his preaching in the eastern regions. His prayer, Lord, show me the way, give me some direction. The Lord answers this prayer by telling him that Macedonia needs help. Well, you need, you know, that, that's helpful, but think for a moment. You know, at the time, Macedonia was a region of approximately 10,000 square miles. And its main city, Philippi, had a population of maybe 10 to 20,000 people. That's, that, talk about finding a needle in a haystack. You know, it's just come over to Macedonia. It's like come over to Canada. You know, from, if you're in the States, come over to Canada. It's huge. However, Paul knew that the direction was west and not east and the territory was Macedonia. He trusted the Lord for further directions when they would be needed. For now, he demonstrated his faith by leaving Troas and heading for Macedonia. Now we've just read that he eventually found the city and the people and the work when he needed to find the city, the people and the work, exactly where God was leading him to. You know, some people, they're not going to take the first step in following the Lord unless he shows them all of the following steps to reach the goal. But that's not how it's worked. That's not how it works. That, that system there, that's called walking by sight. I got 10 steps to take to get to the goal and the Lord has shown me steps one to 10. That's walking by sight. That's not walking by faith. That's, and that's not how the Lord works. Usually the first step is the step of faith and then God will not show us the next step or the final step until we take the first step of faith. You know, we like to play it safe, we like to cover our bets, we like to reduce the risk, not launch out unless success is guaranteed at the starting gate. But a life devoted to Christ sometimes requires us to obey Him first by taking a first step of faith before He reveals the next step or the final step. If the Lord calls you to something, you can be sure of two things. One, if He is the one calling, you will have to walk by faith in order to answer that call. And number two, if He is the one calling, He will provide everything that you will need in due time, if you're ready to answer His call. Okay, so a couple of lessons that we can draw from uh, Paul's experiences. Uh, this is the assignment for the next lesson, uh, number 22 in our series, uh, reading chapter 18, 23, to chapter 21, verse 14. Thank you for your attention and we'll see you next time.